This conference will now be recorded. Jamie, uh, as uh, was mentioned, Jamie is going to lead uh, the, the uh, presentation today, and I will go ahead and turn the time over to, to Jamie. Go ahead, Jamie. Great. Thanks, Bucky. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today. This is the Skull Valley Watershed Plan EA virtual public scoping meeting. Uh, we did just start recording, so there might be a few things that I'm going to repeat that, that Bucky mentioned. Uh, I currently see that we have 15 participants on the video or phone call. Uh, some of those may be overlapped. Uh, there are a few housekeeping items that I would like to mention. Uh, please keep your microphone muted uh, unless, you are, unless you are speaking. Uh, please use the comments. Bucky, as he mentioned, will try to help facilitate those comments. There will be a, an opportunity at the end of this presentation that you uh, will be allowed to provide verbal comments and we can have an open discussion. Um, so with that, I'd like to do an official roll call so I can uh, document everyone's name. If they're here from an agency, uh, identify what agency that is. And for those of us that are on the project team, from the uh, NRCS, from the, uh, from the reservation, from the county, I'd like you to uh, identify yourself and the role that you, you're playing on the, uh, as part of the project. So I am, I will start with myself. Uh, my name is Jamie Sundies. I am with Bowen Collins and Associates. I am an environmental consultant and I am uh, the project manager for the project. You will uh, mostly be listening to my voice today, but I do have others on the call that uh, may participate in portions of the presentation. So with that, I'd like to start with the NRCS and have them each identify. I will go by everyone's name. If I miss anybody, please let me know. So I will start with Norm. I think I see Norm on. Yeah, good morning, Jamie. Yeah, Norm Evans said I'm the Assistant State Conservationist for Partnerships here in Utah, and I'm also the Watershed Operations Program Manager. Perfect, thanks Norm. Derek? Hey, good morning, Jamie. Uh, my name is Derek Hamilton. I'm with NRCS here in the State Office of Salt Lake City. I'm the Water Resources Coordinator, and we'll be providing oversight of the project as we move forward. Thanks, Derek. Jason? Hello, I'm Jason Roper. I'm the state environmental engineer with NRCS in the state office. Great. Thanks, Jason. Um, David, I see that you're on. Would you like to just do a brief, brief introduction of yourself? Uh, David Hanson, district conservationist, so um, more of a local employee here, uh, oversee the office in Tooele. So I'm here just uh, to provide some local help if needed to coordinate anything. Great, thank you. Chet? I'm Chet Fitzgerald. I'm the Assistant State Conservationist for Field Operations for NRCS for the northern half of Utah. And so Twila County is one of my counties, so I'm uh, listening in today to learn about the project. Great, thank you. Anyone else from the NRCS that I missed? Okay. Tooele County. Bucky, are you are you the only one that's on from Tooele County? Uh, at the present moment, we may have uh, commissioners joining us. Uh, they had a 10 o'clock previously scheduled meeting. They thought uh, they were going to be able to join us, but they were going to be late. We'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed. And then uh, Becky Volquick, who is uh, my assistant with emergency management, is also going to be in and in the call, off the call, uh, kind of intermittently. So. Okay, great, thank you. So we'll move on to the Skull Valley Band of Go Shoots. Uh, I know that Dwayne is on. Dwayne, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Dwayne Walsh. I'm the Vice Chair of Skull Valley Band of Go Shoots. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the tribe that's on? Candace Bear, Chairperson for Skull Valley Band of Go Shoots. Thank you, Candice. Okay. We'll move on to Bowen Collins and Associates. I introduced myself. Craig? Craig? 
Craig Bagley. Okay, Craig. Oh, hear me now? Yep. Okay, Craig Bagley, uh, an engineer with Bowen College and Associates. Great, thanks, Craig. Cameron, are you on? I am. I'm Cameron Jenkins with Bowen Collins and Associates. Okay, and I think that's it from Bowen Collins. And then let's go to McMillan Jacobs. Greg? Yeah, Greg Ellington with McMillan Jacobs Associates, uh, leading the NEPA effort for the project. Right, thanks, Greg. Anybody else from McMillan Jacobs? Anybody from the project team that I have missed? Yeah, hi, this is Jessica Peters. I'm the staff NEPA specialist at McMillan Jacobs. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna scroll through these names. Uh, Melissa McCoy, is, are you a public? Yeah, hi, this is Melissa McCoy. I'm from EPA Region 8's NEPA program. Great, thank you. Nancy Williams? Yeah, I'm a wildlife biologist with the Bureau of Land Management in, out of the Salt Lake Field Office. Great, thanks for joining us. Uh, Nicole Ring. Hi, um, I'm a fisheries technician with the BLM out of the Salt Lake Field Office. Okay, great. Thank you all for joining. I think I, I uh, addressed everybody. If I've missed anyone, please let me know. Okay. All right, well, this first uh, uh, slide or image that I'm showing here is the mailer that was sent out. It was sent out to federal and state agencies, uh, county departments and other interest groups, tribal leaders for distribution to the tribe and adjacent property owners. Uh, for more information, you can go to this lower left link. Uh, there will be information that, as it becomes available that will be loaded uh, or uploaded to that link. Um, I'm hoping that we can also upload this video to that link, and I just need to check with the NRCS and make sure that that is um, available. Comments will be received until July 10th. You can also email at svwatershed at bowencollins.com to submit your comment prior to July 10th. So let's go ahead and start the PowerPoint. We just did the introductions. So this is a, getting everyone acquainted with the site where it's located. The Great Salt Lake is up to the north. Uh, Tooele Valley is to the east. And then our project is all located on the, uh, the Skull Valley Reservation on the left side of the Stansbury Mountains. Oftentimes I get questions from agencies, uh, how close are your properties to uh, the project area. It is all located on reservation land. However, we do have BLM property here in the darker green, and you get up into US Forest Service property with this gray gray area to the right of the screen. The green are, are private lands. I will also note that UDOT has uh, land ownership of a portion of the School Valley Road. So the purpose of the meeting today is to explain the project, explain the NEPA process, discuss the project issues, and then also receive input. The purpose of the project in, uh, in early, let me just back up a little bit and explain that in early 2019, Tooele County and the NRCS and the Skull Valley Band of Ghost Shoots worked together to secure funding to assist with the protection of future flooding uh, here at the reservation. Tooele County submitted for what's called a PL 566 program, which is an NRCS watershed protection and flood prevention program. Uh, this program authorizes the NRCS to help local organizations and units of government plan and implement watershed projects. Because the funds used uh, are because the funds that are used are federal, this requires that the watershed plan be evaluated under NEPA uh, or the National uh, Environmental Policy Act. 
Uh, and we'll talk more about that. Greg is actually going to talk more about the NEPA process later in the presentation. So going back to these bulleted items that I have, uh, in 2013, there was a fire that was known as the Patch Springs Fire. Later that same year, there was a flood that occurred and caused um, a large amount of debris to actually flow down Indian Hickman Canyon. Uh, the, at that time, the NRCS uh, assisted by installing some K-rails, or uh, also known as uh, Jersey barriers, to redirect the flow. And in 2014, there was more flooding. So between the years of 2013 and 2014, there were homes in the village that were flooded, and there was also an irrigation pipeline that was damaged. Have I missed anything there, uh, Bucky or NRCS or, or Candace or Dwayne? Does that, for the most part, cover? Yeah, I think you've, you've covered it, yep. Okay. Moving on to this next slide, uh, I mentioned that, the, that there is a, the PL566 program. Uh, this is just showing some of the ongoing watershed uh, plan, pro plan EA projects that are currently ongoing, uh, and we're just highlighted here at the bottom. I just wanted to show that this is, um, there are several projects that are benefiting from this program, and we are one of them. So where are we now? Uh, we kicked off the project in the summer of 2019. We met uh, on the reservation and did a site visit. We conducted some environmental clearances at that time, but not all. Uh, we happened to, to meet with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers from the Sacramento District while we were there. We, um, they are, were doing a concurrent study, and I believe it's uh, looking at, at culverts uh, to cross uh, Skull Valley Road. So we benefited from coordinating with them um, a little bit. And then uh, currently we are here in this red dashed area where we're providing our public scoping process to allow this project to move forward. Um, so after we have this scoping meeting, uh, we will document all the comments and then we will work over the next couple of months to develop design alternatives and address comments from today's meeting. Um, as you can see, in the summer and fall, we will be conducting some environmental, the, the remaining environmental clearances, any geotechnical investigations that may be needed. Uh, and then we will move into a 30% design drawings and the preparation of the NEPA document. Final design for the project is funded would uh, ideally happen in 2021 and then construction of the uh, selected alternatives or preferred alternatives would be in 2022. So the, the, the Watershed Protection and Flood Prevention Program is intended to prevent damage from erosion, flood water, and sediment, furthering the conservation, development, utilization, and disposal of water, and furthering the conservation and proper utilization of land. The planning constraints, the watershed area has to be 250,000 acres or less. And the project uh, benefits or, or the alternatives need to be $25 million or less. Otherwise, if it crosses that $25 million threshold, it will go into a plan EIS. So this is where we are. This is again a list similar to, to another uh, screen that I showed. We conducted a kickoff meeting. We've done some data search and data collection. We've done some preliminary hydrology modeling, which we'll see in some, um, some maps further into the presentation. We have met with the reservation and conducted our site visit. And now here we are at our public scoping. Again, this is open until July 10th. And then uh, following a, a additional engineering in our moving into our NEPA once we are done with our uh, technical memorandums. So I will actually turn the time over to Greg. Well, he'll, he'll explain the NEPA process. Thanks, Jamie. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So NRCS is funding this project, and that's the reason why the National Environmental Policy Act uh, is being implemented and being uh, analyzed on the project. And so right now we are in the process of analyzing it under an environmental assessment. And 
Um, we're also in the process of identifying if there are any other cooperating agencies that would be interested in the project that could use the environmental assessment being performed. Uh, so the project team is reaching out to other federal and state agencies to see if anybody is interested. I don't believe anybody has uh, signed any official letters yet. Is that correct? That's, That's correct, Greg. That's correct, yeah. Uh, cooperating agency letters uh, have been sent to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Army Corps, BLM, Forest Service, and BIA. Thanks, Derek. So, like Jamie mentioned, we are currently in the public scoping and comment period, which is 30 days long. We're identifying resource concerns uh, that will be analyzed in the EA, getting any additional input, questions, information from other agencies, the public, sponsors, uh, stakeholders, identifying the actual problems. Um, and then the biggest thing here is identifying potential alternatives to help remedy the problems. Um, after the scoping period, it will go into concept design and engineering analysis. And then during that time, we will also be reaching out to the other agencies to coordinate and consult Army Corps of Engineers for Waters of the U.S. and Wetlands, Fish and Wildlife Service for Section 7 and Endangered Species, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office for <clears throat> Cultural Resources, uh, and travel, we'll also do travel consultation, and then cooperating agencies, as we already discussed, state agencies, and then the stakeholder, which is the tribe themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So, since it is being federally funded, it requires an analysis under NEPA like we already discussed. Um, so we are basically taking a look at a potential alternatives that will help remedy the problem, develop our purpose and need for the project, and then ultimately we will assess the alternative <clears throat> and the environmental impacts. And then that will allow NRCS state conservationists to make an informed decision about whether to approve the project or if additional analysis is required in an environmental impact statement. So really, there's two basic objectives. To ensure that decision makers consider the environmental, excuse me, the environment and planning projects, both natural and man-made, man -made, and we'll go over that in a second, as well as prevent and minimize damage to the environment. It's basically good decision making that benefits the stakeholder and the environment mutually. Next slide, please. So this is just a quick little figure about um, everything that goes into the NEPA decision-making process. Uh, we look at the social impacts to the community. We look at the environmental impacts, such as wildlife. Um, we look at the economic impacts, how much the project is gonna cost when we do a, a pretty in-depth economic analysis of these projects to make sure that we are using the federal government's funds in an appropriate and justifiable manner. We look at public input, which we are part of the scoping process right now, and then also tribal consultation and working with the tribe in order to make sure they're getting the type of project and uh, meeting their needs. Next slide, please. So when we look at the resource concerns for a project, there's a pretty good list uh, on this sheet right here. It's divided up into soils, water, air, plants, animals, and the human environment. I won't go through the entire list because it's pretty lengthy. But as part of the scoping process, we will identify each one of these resource concerns that can be eliminated from analysis because it's just not relevant. For example, there aren't any coral reefs around the project area. But then we will look at ones that could be in the project area, invasive species, um, public health and safety, things like that. Next slide, thanks. So as part of, since this project is being funded by the Watershed Protection and Flood Prevention Program, we have to identify an authorized purpose according to NRCS regulations. So the left-hand column here just, uh, lists out the specific authorized purposes. For this project, it's probably gonna be flood protection. And uh, there is a description there 
basically it's measures to reduce or prevent floodwater damages by reducing runoff, erosion, and sediment. Now there can be multiple authorized purposes for a project, but we believe that the flood protection is the primary one. And as we go through and, and look at potential alternatives and benefits <clears throat> to the area, uh, we will identify that in the environmental assessment about how we got to that. Now the nice part about this is that the flood protection is actually cost shared under this program up to 100% funded by NRCS. And so as we go through this whole process and develop the cost estimate and coordinate more with NRCS uh, state and headquarters level, we'll identify what that cost share will specifically be for the project. So the NEPA process, right now we're in scoping. We'll go into the concept design development, then our very first version of this will be an internal preliminary draft plan EA. Kind of a mouthful, we'll just call it a, a plan EA uh, moving forward with this. Once that goes through all of the internal state and federal reviews, we will come back out to the public and have another 30-day public comment period with the draft plan EA. This is when everybody will have a chance to look at the alternative being proposed, look at the environmental assessment um, of impacts that in our analysis of all of it and provide comments back on the project. We will then take those comments after the 30-day comment period is closed and develop the final plan EA. This final plan EA goes to the state conservationist. They will, re he will, or they will review it and decide whether they will issue a finding of no significant impact, which means the project is approved, or if there is a significant impact or further analysis is required, which would be the preparation of an environmental impact statement. Once that is complete, assuming that the FONSI would be issued, the project team would then uh, issue the administrative record. It would go into NRCS files, and then the project would go to actual final design. I will make a note, this NEPA analysis is taking into consideration a conceptual design of the project. So we talk about it maybe a 15 to 30 percent design level. After NEPA is done, then it will go into final design and they will create issued for construction drawings. Great. Thanks, Greg. You always do a great job uh, with the NEPA portion, so I'm, I appreciate your chiming in there. So going back to the project area, this I, I've um, shown the project impacts in red uh, for reference, Indian Hickman Canyon, Dry Canyon further to the south, and then the Skull Valley Road to the left side of the screen. This is an aerial that, that shows existing conditions from Google. Uh, again, Indian Hickman Canyon, Dry Canyon, and then Skull Valley Road. The reservation, the village is all located uh, for the most part in the middle of the screen. This photo is taken looking upstream uh, at Indian Hickman Canyon, uh, US Forest Service land up here at the top. And then you can see all of this debris. Uh, this photo probably doesn't do this justice, but th there is a, a, a lot of debris that is actually came out of this canyon. You can see the fire with all the burnt vegetation uh, as well, and then a trickle of water, which uh, you don't see very much. It disappears into the ground uh, shortly after this photo. And just kind of showing existing conditions, this is near the village, uh, Indian Hickman coming through here where you see the, the vegetation, most of the vegetation growing. So this figure has been prepared to show some of the ideas that we've had in talking with the reservation, uh, with the county, and with the NRCS. Uh, these are all conceptual. Some of these would have to work in conjunction with each other. They, they may not be able to be standalone improvements. Uh, one thing I want to note is this is a computer simulated rainfall uh, flood hazard areas that you see in blue. So you can see where a lot of the flooding has the potential of coming right through the village, uh, but most of the water would come to the south of the village. So one thing that we've looked at is whether we develop some type of berm that, that uh, sends the water north 
and around the village. Uh, another berm that would take and divert everything to the south of the village. Uh, looking at adding, possibly adding some type of land formations, which would be very uh, gentle terracing to help distribute that water and then uh, direct it into a channel to the north or to the south. Uh, another alternative that we have considered is whether we need to put a sediment or a water detention area further upstream and uh, reduce or, or release water gradually. And then uh, showing the residential area here in red. Property lines are dashed. So I'm, I am showing that uh, all of these project improvements would be on reservation land. And I think the next slide is just talking about uh, any other projects that we're coordinating with. As I mentioned earlier, it's the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers has a culvert sizing project that they uh, have prepared. And if we can uh, get the final results of that, then we can find the locations of where they've identified these culverts along Skull Valley Road. So we can help divert the water in the appropriate area to cross this road and uh, continue further to the west. So from my engineers at Bowen Collins, I don't know if anybody has any uh, additional information they wanna add pertaining to this slide. Uh, but this concludes the, um, the overall presentation that I have prepared, and I can open this up for questions. I just hey, comment. Jamie. Go ahead. I was just going to say that, that this land is all on an alluvial fan, and as we noticed in that, there's the first photograph after the fire, we had some big rain events, that, and then we had some big runoff events, and the runoff events then associated with that was a lot of erosion. And then with the erosion, there's a lot of sediment transport. And so Jamie was calling it debris, but it was it's just rocks and soil that came out of the canyon with burned out trees and stuff. So that's very common on an alluvial fan. That's what creates an alluvial fan is flooding and the transport of that sediment that we call alluvium. So it's it's not uncommon that uh, when, when you get those radial contours at the, at the mouth of an alluvial canyon or on an alluvial fan, that you know the a, a creek or a a stream can there might be one there, and then you'll have a flooding event and debris and sediment can could plug and then it can just turn and go 90 degrees or anywhere else on the fan so uh anyway i just wanted to bring out the point that you know water can go anywhere on that fan and that's what we're it, it, it does it doesn't necessarily have to stay confined to the channel and its existing location that channel location can change thanks craig that was craig bagley with bowen collins derek i think you had a comment yeah, hey Jamie. Um, also, just wanted to point out to the group that um, this project is going to look at uh, alternatives to address um, floods and preventing floods in the future, but it's also going to establish a watershed boundary. And that, that's pretty important for Forest Service folks and BLM folks to understand why we reached out to them and requested them to participate as a cooperating agency. It's not because the project measures are located on their lands, it's because the, the larger watershed boundary includes their lands. So, so that's important to understand that we're actually gonna be establishing that boundary with this plan as well. Um, and then in addition to that, I just wanted to point out to folks that we typically have a 30 day uh, public notice period uh, associated with these plans and these public meetings. Uh, but in this case, we went ahead and extended it to 45 days uh, just because of our, our virtual meeting scenario and just giving folks a little bit additional time uh, because of these unique circumstances. So just wanted to throw that out there. And uh, again, uh, thanks everyone for uh, calling in and participating. Thank you. And that's a good point. I have, a, a, I briefly popped that up. I'm going to see if I can bring up that watershed boundary that was uh, identified in the proposal. 
But while I'm doing that, does anybody else have any other comments? I, have, I did notice that we had somebody join us. Uh, we're now up to 16 participants. There's a Carolyn Gleason. Do you mind just uh, letting us know, are you from an agency or, uh, or from a, the public? Hi there, I'm uh, with EPA Region 8, the NEPA program there, along with Melissa McCoy. Great, thank you. So I, uh, I was hoping to extract this, but, um, but that's okay, I will just show it in here. So uh, this black outline, I think, was uh, the study boundary. It doesn't necessarily capture the exact watershed boundary, but you can see that this does extend up further, like Derek was saying, into the forest, and that is, and, and it also crosses BLM land. But our project area is down here in this yellow. Okay, and looking at any comments, I don't see that anybody has submitted any questions or comments. So if we don't have any other, Jamie, uh, yes. Jamie, do you want to do you want to talk a little bit about? I mean, we just mentioned the alternatives, but you know, if we build a detention basin at the mouth of the canyon, that would require a dam, and it would require probably a lot of maintenance. So that I mean, that's one thing that we'll consider. Um, if we develop, if we develop. A, a, some type of diversion berm or dike or levee down below that would be you know probably require not a lot of maintenance and, a, and the, its primary purpose would basically to try and and uh, divert any of that sheet flow that may be leaving the channel and out on the fan and just divert it around uh, around to a place where if it floods it's not going to damage anything so we could either go north or south and then those land formations would be a series of, of you know, a short berm and an opening, a short berm and an opening. Uh, it's almost like a, a maze where it would allow a lot of the sediment to, uh, a lot of the sediment that's often carried with a, with a flood event in the, on, on the fan and allow that sediment to drop out and then the water could kind of go in the fan and uh, and we'd still have to figure out where we wanted to put the water, but that's a way to kind of naturally try and get the sediment and some of the water to dissipate on the fan itself. Okay, thanks, Craig. Jamie, this is Bucky. Question for Candace or uh, Dwayne. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you two, but we had a. Uh, a detention basin or a, a small reservoir up there in the past. Um, is that something that the tribe would like to see designed or is that a is that a priority or do the members of the tribe have a priority that they would um, like to voice an opinion or concern related to? I haven't heard nothing about um, any concerns about another reservoir, but I know we had some in the past, a couple of them that I was made aware of, and um, I don't see no problem with the reservoir. You know, I've always seen it as something that was good. You know, I didn't, I didn't have nothing against it. That's where I stand on it. Okay, Candice, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, just to add to that. So I, I've heard several comments about the reservoir. Um, most members that have spoken to me were in favor of it and felt that it was something that needed to continue. The, they would also uh, discuss possibility of, um, before that reservoir, you know, there was some runoff that did come through. People did have cattle and agriculture that was going on. And I know that they, you know, have just one of that. That's something they would like to see again uh, in some shape or form. So I, I think the reservoir is always a 
I think Norm asked if there's been any feedback from UDOT. Uh, I don't think that we have received any feedback from UDOT with regards to Skull Valley Road. Derek, have you um, have you heard anything from UDOT? I have not. Okay. I just think I just think we include them as a stakeholder and uh, keep dumping information on them as as we learn more. Okay. Jamie, for the record, I have had conversations with uh, one of their, their managers in the area. They run into a chronic challenge of trying to keep two of their culverts uh, clear um, out in that general area. And so they are, uh, I guess, favorable to, to whatever can be done to uh, uh, above to, to try to you know, minimize the challenges that they, they are having with that as well. Okay. And uh, hey, Jamie, um, this is Derek again, and I guess this may be for Craig as well, but we don't envision this being a water impounding. I mean, as far as, sorry, a, um, anyway, I'm looking at the reservoir. It's going to be more of a debris basin than, a, than holding water at all times, correct? Any type of well, think, any type of proposed basin. I think the reservoir they're talking about, Jamie, pull up. Well, it's right there in the middle of the screen, I think. Uh, it's I think it's the one right there by the K rails. I, I believe is that the one you're talking about, Dwayne? Is that a, the one right above the community center, uh, right across from the well? Yeah. Yeah, that was the last um, running. Reservoir we had. I'm assuming yep. that that probably got its water from that pipe and not yeah. not from the. Yeah, it was coming out from a pipe that was underneath the ground, the one that we looked at when you guys first came out. So as as part of so we got to figure out as part of this project is putting water back in that pond one of our objectives, and if we do that we would probably have to reestablish that irrigation pipe. The irrigation diversion, or, or I don't know if it was all for irrigation, but what I understand, there was a, a diversion where they took water out of at the mouth of the canyon that was in the, the drainage, put it in a pipe, and it came down. Part of it went here. I guess in the end, I think part of it was dirt, diverted over to uh, the... Uh, uh, what do you call it? The waste, the staging. What do you call that? Anyway, um, and uh, and then I think if it wasn't being used, it would just go down the stream or down down the old wash. But for the most part, and you know, when you get to certain times of year, if you didn't take the water from the mouth of the canyon, you'd never get it in the creek because it all goes into the ground. So. That's important to us. I think we we need to know is is reestablishing that diversion and, and replacing that pipe part of this project, or is it just flood prevention for the truck that you know down for the village? That that helps. I, I just we've had some uh, misunderstanding at some public meetings on other projects when we talk about you know constructing a dam, and some folks understand that it's a dry dam, and others believe it's going to be a reservoir. With recreational opportunities, so just just wanted to kind of dial in on that a little bit. So thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So in this case, you know, one of the alternatives would be to build a dam at the mouth of the canyon, but I but that would be, you know, it, it would it would have a visual impact, but it would be a dry dam most of the time, uh, and it wouldn't provide. It would just be a dry detention facility, and the only time it would have any significant water in it would be during a large storm event. And after a large cloudburst, uh, or after several of them, it, you know, it's likely to, to, a facility like that would have to be cleaned out every once in a while because it's going to fill with sediment and debris. And to, to have the life that we would want it to do, it would require maintenance with large equipment and then you have to find somewhere to dispose of all of that material. So that would be you know one of the downsides to an alternative like that. Uh, if you wanted to just, you know, re you know, go up and reconstruct a diversion, 
up there, it's kind of it, that, that the forces of nature are pretty wild up there. And although that diversion probably uh, was there for a long time, if we have another event like that, it could wash out. I don't, I don't know what we could do to keep it from washing out, but the pipe and the diversion did wash out in some of those floods. So we'd have to look at, you know, how, what could we do to protect what we put back in if that's part of the project. So on my screen, I currently have some photos. Uh, I think at one point we did get a photo of that pipe, but I'm not sure if it's in this group that I'm looking at right now. So uh, I guess the question is may, maybe for Dwayne and Candace, is this diversion and pipeline something that we need to look at uh, reestablishing? Yeah, I would like to have that water reverted back down to the reservoir. You know, to have one of those reservoirs would be something good for us. And to lay that piping back down is good too. I see that as a benefit for us. And if that fits into the scope of projects that we're doing, I'm all for it. You know, and I and I have been up there and I've seen all those water lines, those pipes. They they're all they're all messed up. So everything would have to be replaced and be established and securely covered and you know I don't know how we're going to go about it but you know that would be something that I'll I'll be for okay sounds like we will add that uh into our evaluation all right was it the waste transfer station is that where the water used to go where most of it used to go no, I don't believe so. Uh, Candace, do you answer that? No, none of that was ever used for the waste transfer station. Okay. Where yeah, did where did the pipe water go? Source. Okay. So we we take we we take the water from the mouth of the canyon, and then where did the pipe go? Down to the Derek or Jason, did you guys, we talked about this at one point, but did you guys kind of as built what that used to be? I'm not familiar, Craig. I, I haven't seen anything. I'll have to check with Amy Rohner and see what she's got because I know she did that design for the the new pipeline and that out there. I'll have to ask her what she. Craig, we do have an ad uh, PDF that uh, Amy had provided us. Do you want me to pull that up on the screen? Yeah, if you would please, let's just see what what they said it used to be. Are you able to see that? Yes. Although this doesn't show the pipe that goes up the canyon, this just shows the stuff right down by the village. They, we didn't do anything and they just started right here and that's where they did the project was start right down closer to the the homes and the residents so this might be a separate system then because it looks like this was work that was done to get water back to the transfer station so i know that there was a diversion up a little bit higher so we'd would have to do some work to figure out i don't know Dwayne, or if 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 you know anything about the old system if we want to put it back the way it was. We just need to know where it went and where it ended. If you could help us with that. Yeah, I don't know about water being sent down to the waste management or what, what he's talking about. I That's new on me. I, as far as I know, it just came down to the reservation. I didn't know that there was an alternative water source going over that way to the waste. 
know, so far as I know, everything that was coming down from the mouth of the mountain with those pipes were coming straight down to the community and the reservoir. Okay. You're, you're probably right with regard to what was There's coming down. He's looking at. I'm not familiar with it. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure. So it looks like there was a system that came from the mouth of the canyon that probably came down to the pond, and right. there's another system that probably came from your wells and maybe the tank that went over to the transfer stations. It looks like there were two separate systems. So I believe those are coming from the wells, from my understanding. I don't believe it's coming straight from the mouth of the mountain. And that's what it looks like. Okay. I'm not sure. You know, maybe Candace might have another better idea on it. I, I'm not. Yeah. Do you know Candace? So on the previous system, um, we had piping that was next to the reservoir piping for the culinary system. And then after the flood, that was washed out. So we had to install a new tank, and we've had to pipe that separately now. For the way station, they have gathered their water from a separate system, um, from what I've seen from the mapping from the travel office and speaking to people with management. I am not certain of what you're seeing in which it's coming straight down into the village, but um, we can look it over and then get that clarified. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hey, Jamie. Do we have any any other comments? Questions? Anything else we want to look at and discuss? Hey, Jamie, this is Norm. Um, maybe with that issue, some detail in the water rights documentation might show some more information too. Okay. Check that, Norm. Uh, there aren't any, and there's there's no record of any point of diversion in the state records, but I think because of because it's on tribal lands, I don't think they need water rights, from what I understand. At least that's what I was, I've read that somewhere, I think. Is that, is that the case? Something we need to confirm. Yeah, probably just something just to confirm and, and do a check on it, I guess. Okay, we'll check on Verify water rights. Any other comments? Any of the agencies that have joined us? Does anybody have any questions or comments from the EPA, BLM, Forest Service? Okay. Well, I'll just give everyone one last opportunity if if we have any questions otherwise uh, we'll wrap up this presentation and send a link or place a link to this uh recorded presentation and um norm or derek can you confirm are we able to add a link to uh the project to this link down here at the nrcs's website are we able to provide a link to this video yes Okay. Yeah, we can we can arrange that. Okay. So if anybody wants to go back and uh, listen to this video again, you're welcome to go to this link. Again, comments, please submit comments via email to svwatershed at bowencollins.com. Comments will be received through July 10th. And with that, I will... Um, I will wrap this up. I thank everybody for participating. I think doing uh, these virtually sometimes allows uh, additional agencies to listen in and participate that sometimes uh, they're not able to. So thank you very much for listening uh, via phone or video and um, have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Becky, you can stop the recording now.